Thank you, Dr. Ramakrishnan Sharma. May I now request Dr. Suresh Nath, Registrar of Guwahati University, to introduce the honourable speaker. Chancellor of the University, Professor Nalik Palmonto, Director of the Center, invited guests, teachers, officers, employees, and my dear university students and particularly school students, children present here. Let us heartily welcome Honorable Dr. Lobsang Sengi who was born in 1968 and was reared in a Tibetan settlement near Darjeeling. He completed his BA honors and LLB degrees from Delhi University. In 1995, he won the Fulbright Scholarship to pursue postgraduate studies at Harvard University and in 2004, he became the first ever Tibetan to receive a JD degree from Harvard Law School for his PhD dissertation on democracy in distress. Each exile polity a remedy, a case study of Tibet's government in exile. Dr. Sangi is a recipient of the Young K. Kim. 1995 prize and in 2005 he was appointed as a research fellow and promoted to senior fellow till early 2011 at Harvard University. Dr. Sengi is an expert on international human rights law, democratic constitutionalism and conflict resolutions. He has spoken at numerous uh, seminars around the world and he organized himself several major conferences, including two very unprecedented meetings between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Chinese scholars in 2003 and 2009 at Harvard University. In 2011, he was elected to the post of Sikkim, the democratically elected leader of the Tibetan people and political successor to His Holiness the Dalai Lama of Tibet. On August 8, 2011, during the in ceremony of Sikkim, His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, I quote, When I was young, an elderly reason that when Rinpoche handed over Sikkim, that is political leadership, to me, and today I am handing over Sikkim to young Longsheng Sengri, and in doing this, I have fulfilled my long cherished goal. In May 2016, Dr. Sengri was re elected as a Sikkim, termed as the president from 2017 onwards for the second consecutive term and in the and the swearing ceremony was graced by his holiness the Dalai Lama. Dr. Sengri was awarded Presidential Medal Award by Salisbury University in USA in 2015. He received the gold medal of the College Historical Society of Trinity College Dublin for outstanding contribution to public discourse by the Auditor of the Society, Ms. Ursula Nilchari. Dr. Senge has painted uh, many editorials and other articles for many of the leading news sites such as The Guardian, then Washington Post and The Hill to name a few. Let us again welcome Dr. Lobson Senge amongst us. Thank you very much. making sure that I speak not long so that we have uh, time for uh, Q&A. So I just want to say Namaskar Odor Bumha Kwan. 
I'm trying my Assamese here. I hope, did I pronounce it okay? Yeah, I barely pass, it looks like, from the reaction of the teachers. I just want to thank uh, Professor Nani Mahanta for uh, inviting me because we were together at uh, India Ideas Conclave in Goa. And it seems he liked whatever I said at that conference, which I've completely forgotten. So with expectation, uh, he has invited me to come and share my thoughts. Uh, but uh, I must say, uh, you all will be uh, sorely disappointed because after my talk, you will feel it was not worth missing your classes. The only thing that you remember, it, it looks as per the schedule, that I did came on time. I arrived at 11 a.m. and then we started the program before time, before 11.30. So that's what we'll remember. Other than that, I don't think you'll remember much of what I have to say. Uh, but I also want to thank, you know, VC uh, Dr. Mirudul Azarika for being a uh, kind host and for kind introduction. I think you said more about peace than I'm going to talk about peace. And Mahanda talked more about Tibet than there's nothing left for me to say, actually. And I also want to thank um, Himanta Biswa Sarna, the minister who I met yesterday at the airport and I was with him at Goa and he might join us later, uh, if not at the event, maybe for lunch. Um, and then I just want to uh, also uh, thank Dr. Suresh Nath Register for his kind introduction. Uh, and uh, it's a really honor and privilege uh, to be here uh, at your university. It's one of the top 50 and Vice Chancellor was saying that uh, you all are shooting for the top 10 in the whole of India and I wish you all the best that you do join the top 10 university of India. And uh, uh, it looks, uh, it's part of the program of the Southeast Asia Studies is to reach out to ASEAN countries. And I think Guwahati, a special university, is placed very well where you can impart education to us and the countries, many of them want to learn in English medium instruction and so that way Guwahati University is well placed and I am sure now the students from Bhutan and Laos they have joined and I hope other countries will join and this university does become uh, the top 10 uh, in all of India. Unfortunately, I didn't study, I didn't get to study here but when I was Delhi University uh, as uh, you know, Vice Chancellor and the Registrar said, uh, I, because I'm from Darjeeling area, so whenever I see students from Northeast, somehow we club together, we become friends. You know, so that sense of solidarity and bonding is there. So to be uh, here and share some thoughts uh, means a lot, uh, personally as well. Because when Tibet was occupied in 1959, my mother and father came from, they used to say Assam. My father came from Bumdila and my mother came from uh, Tuting area. So they used to always say, oh, we came from Assam and we spent a few months and, you know, uh, in fact, my mother spent two or three years uh, in, in, in and around these places. So just three years ago, I managed to come uh, in my current position to Northeast and I went to Arunachal Pradesh and saw the places where my parents came from. Uh, so next day is going to be 60th year when the Solanus Dalai Lama came from Tibet to Arunachal Pradesh through Tawang and entered India through Tejpur and Assam. So there's a long, definitely a long history and there was a, a, a what do you call, long relationship uh, with the issue of Tibet uh, as well. So it's really a uh, privilege and honor. Now I briefly uh, touch on international aspect of things and perhaps touch on nonviolence and peace. Then I'll go a little back to history and uh, the current situation in Tibet and some final thoughts on what are the solutions, why you know uh, peace uh, and the role of India and the future of Tibet is relevant or not. Um, as you all, many of the students, you will be graduating soon and entering the real world. Now in the real world, what's happening is that it has changed a lot in the last 30 years. 
there is decline of internationalism and decline of liberalism, which you saw in the late 80s and 90s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and Berlin Wall. There was a new hope, you know, and uh, democracy was prevailing and spreading around the world, and human rights was a very popular thing, environmental issues, so liberalism was on the rise, and internationalism was on the rise. And that was the dominant ideology. But in the last five, ten years, there are a lot of challenges and complexities. Now, in place of internationalism, there is rise of nationalism. In place of liberalism, there is rise of extremism. And we have right-wing parties, right-wing ideologies around the world. Uh, you know, with the election of Donald Trump, and if you look at some of the European countries, the you know, United Kingdom getting out of you know, uh, EU through Brexit, all these are indications of rise of nationalism. And then uh, you see now, just a few days ago, another uh, extremist or a terrorist who bulldozed a lot of people in the streets of New York that you see in Brussels and Paris. Now it's a common thing, but there is a rise of extremism and there is violence prevailing all over the world. So the internationalism and liberalism are challenged by nationalism and extremism. Now in that context, what's happening around the world is also that violence gets the headlines. Nonviolence doesn't. Extremism gets the headlines. Liberalism doesn't. Hence, this topic is fitting. If you want world peace, if you want peace, nonviolence should be applauded and supported and accepted. Doesn't get much space in the media, in the international context as well. In that sense, Tibet issue is a model of peace because we pursue nonviolence. We pursue the Gandhian philosophy of Ahimsa. Yet, you don't get much traction, but you get traction if your IS, Syria violence, Boko Haram in Nigeria, these are the headlines that you see anywhere around the world. So hence this topic and the platform that I'm given is very relevant. Now another rise which is directly challenged to the whole world and Asia and India in particular is rise of China. As you graduate and leave this university, if you go anywhere around the world or within India, Chinese presence will loom large. They will be in ASEAN countries, they will be in Northeast, they will be in all the neighboring countries. For example, the recent incident of Doklam, we all read the Chinese troops came to Doklam and they wanted to take over the mountain top. And the headline was that they want to control or have, uh, you know, from military point of view, have some dominance over the chicken neck. And for Northeast, chicken neck is very important. That small 25, 27 kilometers of land, which connects the rest of India with the Northeast. If that is cut off, the Northeast and rest of India will be separated. So if you control Doklam height, that mountain, then you can control, you could have an artillery reach uh, to the chicken neck. Then the whole debate in India and Asia in particular was why Doklam, why is happening, what are the causes, what are the reasons, is the Solomon's Dalam of visit to Arunachal Pradesh was the reason, or Tibetan presence in, in India was the reason, what are the reasons, the reasons are very simple. Because after the occupation of Tibet by communist China in 1950s, Mao Zedong, the Chinese leader then, and other Chinese leaders have said, and it's recorded, Tibet is the palm. We must occupy Tibet. Then we extend our influence to other five fingers. And what are the five fingers? Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, Ladakh, and Arunachal Pradesh. These are the five fingers. So what you see, or what you saw in Doklam, is the reality of Confucius Chinese expansionist policy. Because Tibet was lost, 
because Tibet was occupied, extension of Chinese influence and their presence to all the five fingers are a reality, which the Chinese army and military will make efforts. That we must accept. Because why? Chinese expansionist design is also there in the South China Sea, East China Sea, Scarborough Island, in all of Asian countries. Yesterday when I was talking to, even I talked to former ambassador to Burma of India, right in Burma, the northern part of Burma, the largest city, Mandalay, is becoming a Chinese-speaking city instead of Burmese-speaking city. The presence is everywhere. So an expansionist design will be felt for the people in the Northeast and whole northern belt of India or the Himalayan belt of India. Hence, this is a reality that we must face. And then China as a challenge to Asia, to the world, is also the reality because President Xi Jinping just got re-elected and his definition of socialism is Chinese characteristic in new era, in new era, because this will begin the third era or the new era for China in the global context. And then they will be more reaching out or influencing or expanding to the international forum, including South Asia and ASEAN and rest of Asia. So this is a reality one must face. Hence, what is the role of India or relationship between India and Tibet, which is very relevant? Because when Tibet was occupied in 1950s, rest of the world, including India, felt at that time that what happened in Tibet happened to Tibet. We know it's wrong, but we are sorry. We can't do much about it, or we won't do much about it, but it's not going to happen to us. That's what the world felt. That's what all the neighboring countries believed. But with South China Sea, instead South China Sea, East China Sea, Scarborough Island, Philippines, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, now in Doklam, in India, now their presence in Burma and Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Pakistan, everybody is saying, what happened in Tibet? Similar things are happening to the rest of the world. So hence, the lesson we all should learn, and we, the Tibetans, have been saying this for 60 years. What happened to us will happen to you, not could, will happen to you. So letting China occupy Tibet and the rest of the world not speaking for Tibet was wrong. Now, it happened to us, now they're expanding the five fingers. And they will expand all the neighboring countries. So had international community in Asia included, had done something for Tibet then, in the 1950s, perhaps Chinese government won't think of expanding to Nepal, Bhutan, Ladakh, Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim, and ASEAN countries, the rest of Asia. Because they've got away with Tibet. They think now they can get away with the rest of the world. And they did. And it is happening around the world. Even in Doklam, yes, there is a withdrawal of troops from 150 meters each, which means there's a separation of 300 meters, but the tanks, the guns, the Chinese army, the Indian army are still exactly the same, just 300 meters apart. So the Doklam incident is just the beginning of things to come. So what happened to Tibet? And what is the relationship, or what was the relationship with India, and where lessons can be learned? For example, similar convention, there is similar convention in Pakistan, the similar convention in Tibet happened in 1914. What happened was, Tibet and British India came to Simla, then to Delhi, they signed an agreement, similar convention. On the sideline, they signed two other agreements, mainly on trade and border. Now in India, we always say, Magmohan Line is the border between India and China. But if Magmohan Line is the border between India and China, it was Tibetan Prime Minister who signed the Simla Convention and the border then with the British representative, Sir Magmohan.
hence the border is called McMahon Line because it was the Tibetan Prime Minister who signed the document, who signed the convention, the similar convention in 1914. So if McMahon Line is the border, that is the Tibetans who signed the border. So if you want to have McMahon Line as the border, then you must recognize the status of Tibet. Story. Now, Chinese claim of Arunachal Pradesh and other areas in the Himalayan are partly based on history. But unless you study the similar convention in 1914, you won't understand. Why? Because the Chinese ambassador did participate in the similar convention. They, in the end, initialed the agreement, but finally did not sign the agreement. But if you read that part of history, you will find the Chinese ambassador was objecting to the border demarcation between Tibet and China. They were this bothered about border between Tibet and India. They didn't say anything on the border of India and Tibet. India and uh, India and Tibet. They let the Tibetan Prime Minister sign that border demarcation. Now, when they make the claim of Arunachal Pradesh, you can go back to 1914 and say Chinese government. You never made any presentation or claim of Arunachal Pradesh when the Tibetan government, led by Tibetan Prime Minister, signed that agreement. So, unless you understand similar convention of Tibet, you won't understand the complexities. And it's relevant. Number two, 1914. On the sideline, they also signed a trade agreement between India and Tibet. So trade agreement from Natula to Shigatse to Lhasa. Now they, that trade agreement has to be renewed every 10 years, from 1914 to 24, 34, till 1944. Delhi and Lhasa, the capital city of Tibet, signed and renewed that trade agreement every 10 years. But in 1954, after the independence of India, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru felt, then Indian government felt, that we must sign the treaty or the trade agreement, not with Tibetan government in Hassa, but with Beijing. This is a very important lesson we all must know. So the trade agreement has to be renewed every 10 years. So 1954, the Indian delegation goes to Beijing and negotiates the trade agreement and Finally, the punch document comes. Now, the Indian side wanted the punch agreement to last for 25 years. And China said, no, 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 only five years. Then they negotiated further, and finally China agreed for eight years. When you have an agreement or conventional treaty, Normally, you know, the treaty should last for 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. You know, you find the given number. You just say 8 years. It's an odd number. Now, what happened in 5 years and what happened in 8 years? Initial Chinese preference was that punishment would last for 5 years. 1954, after 5 years, 1959, Tibet was occupied. 1954 plus 8 years, 1962. 1962, India-China war happened, and the Chinese army came all the way to Arunachal, Bundila, Tawang, came all the way almost to Tejpura Basan. What it shows is that the Chinese side, they already calculated what they are going to do in 5 years and 10 years. When India said it should last 25 years, they said, no, 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 they said 5 years. But they had only planned to occupy Tibet. Which means, had the trade agreement lasted five years, they would have occupied Tibet and invaded India. Because India said eight years, and then India eight years, and in 1962 war happened. This is how they think, this is how they plan. Hand palm as Tibet and five fingers, Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, Ladakh, and Arunachal, it's real. It's part of the strategy. So we must know that. So these are the lessons. We all must learn. In fact, after the occupation of Tibet in 1959, Chinese government requested the Indian government that Calcutta seaport be allowed to be used for Chinese supplies. Because they say our troops are there, our people are there, officials are there. They find it difficult to supply from China through land route to Tibet. 
They said, can we use Calcutta Seaport through Sikkim? They can uh, provide supplies. Indian government allowed Calcutta Seaport to be used. In 1962 war, Chinese army had better supplies and more supplies than Indian troops because they had used Calcutta as a seaport and Natula as a supply route. So, unless you know this part of history, you won't know what's going to happen. Hence, if you want to understand China, you must understand Tibet. If you truly want to understand what is China's next move, you must understand the Tibet experience. If you don't understand Tibet experience, you won't know China. For example, One Bell, One Road initiative is going on. This is the China's foreign policy, economic policy, military policy. What is One Bell, One Road? Occupation of Tibet happened with one road. China promised us highway from China to Lhasa. It said that it will bring prosperity. Tibetans sang songs and participated. Tibetan labors were paid gold coins and silver coins. There was a song by my parents and grandparents. Oh, Chinese are like our parents. When they come, they shower you with gold and silver. They took gold and silver and helped build highway. In fact, Chinese government was so smart, they built a gold and silver factory, gold and silver coin factory in Sichuan, so that you can supply. Why? Their calculation was this gold and silver coins are coming back to us anyways after the occupation of Tibet. Once the highway was completed, trucks came, tanks came, guns came, and occupied us. They planned all this, and all the silver coins, the gold coins the Tibetans had, all went back to China. Along with it, 75% of all the idols in the monasteries made out of gold and silver and diamond and all kinds of uh, precious stones, all were taken to China, melted and sold in the antique market. So hence you must know this part of history, that's why I wanted to emphasize that. Now, how is Tibet relevant? Now you might, if you hear all bloom and gloom kind of story, you might feel bad. Now let me give you a positive story where India has played a role and Tibet has played a role and it will be good for all of us. That is, this is where I come to the role of India and future of Tibet as well. In 7th and 8th centuries, Tibetan translators Tibetan scholars came from Tibet to Nalanda University and in India. They learned Sanskrit, they learned Buddhism. And 7th and 8th century, Buddhism was introduced to Tibet. Now, Nalanda University was demolished and collapsed in 13th century. So it lasted a thousand plus years. But, Tibetan scholars were so good, they learned Sanskrit so well, Buddhism so well, they translated the teachings of Buddha and students in Tibetan and they preserved in Tibet. Now you know, there are so many Buddhist countries, so all the ASEAN countries are Buddhist. Japan, China, everywhere. If you want to truly find teachings of Buddha, China has less than 12, 24 volumes, less than two dozen volumes on what Buddha and his disciples actually said. All the Buddhist countries, any of the Buddhist countries, they don't have more than a dozen or two dozen volumes of what Buddha and his disciples said. It is only in Tibetan language you have 300 volumes. Hence, if you want to know what Buddha said and his disciples said, Nowhere in the world you will find, except in Tibetan language, Kanju and Tenju. So hence, Tibetan Buddhism and Tibetan language, this Buddhist text is very important. Yes or no? Hence, preservation is very important. Now what happened was in 1959, 1956 on, 98% of Tibetan monasteries and nunneries were destroyed. 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns were destroyed, sent to labor camps, many died of hunger, many died of starvation, many went to uh, prisons as well. 
Now, Chinese government felt, Mao Zedong included, felt that wow, we have converted Tibet into China, we have converted Tibet into Chinese, we won. But his holiness is there, huh? And 80,000 Tibetans, including my parents, who came from Assam, that's what we used to say, from Arunachal through Teshpu, they came to India. We rebuilt Buddhist monasteries from the ashes of destruction, brick by brick, stone by stone. We built Buddhist monasteries that you see everywhere, including Tawang. We call it Tibetan monasteries, but actually this is the replica and revival of Nalanda monasteries. Nalanda tradition. Now Historians has plan A, B, C, D, E. A was revive Buddhism among exiled Tibetans, which we did successfully. Plan B was to revive Buddhism in the Himalayan belt, from Tawang to Laos, Spiti to Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, and Ladakh. Why? Because our plan was very simple. That if exiled Tibetans cannot go to Tibet and revive Buddhism, the people in the Himalayan belt can cross the mountains and revive Buddhism in Tibet. But now mountain is mountain terrain is very difficult. Now there's Magmon line guarded by Chinese troops. You can't cross over that easily. Plan C was to revive Buddhism in all the Western world, including ASEAN countries, with a lot of Buddhist centers. Teach foreigners Buddhism. And they Foreigners and their teachers will go back to Beijing and to Hassa and revive Buddhism in Tibet. So they will take continental airlines, or US airlines, or European airlines, and they fly because we cannot cross the mountain. Now, Plan D if you go to Tibet now, Buddhism has been revived. From the ashes of destruction, from 98% of monasteries in Nanan is destroyed. Now, most of the major monasteries in Tibet is revived. From 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns destroyed, many thousands and thousands of monks and nuns are practicing Buddhism in Tibet. But now, Chinese government policy is systematic destruction of Buddhism and Tibetan culture, Tibetan language, because they want to have cultural assimilation, assimilate Tibetans and Chinese. But in their private space, social space, Tibetans on their own, they have rebuilt these monasteries and nuns. That shows the dynamism and hard work and determination of the Tibetan people. We are small in number, but after the destruction of 98 and 99%, normally you give up hope because you have only 1% one one chance of success. But we work very, very, very hard. You know the interesting thing what has happened now? You know the largest Buddhist country in the world? Where is it? It's China. China has 300 to 400 million Buddhists. Now Mao Zedong and Chao Wang Lai, they thought they will destroy Buddhism in Tibet and make it into a communist atheist place. Instead, now Buddhism has not only revived in Tibet, it has revived in China. So I'm sure Mao Zedong is rolling in his grave thinking what the hell happened. I wanted to go to Tibet and destroy everything. Instead, they brought Buddhism to China. Now Buddhism has permanent place. Hence, the fight or the cause, non-violence or violence, peace or not, we Tibetans believe we will prevail. Peace will prevail, non-violence will prevail. Because the competition between China and Tibetan people is very simple. It's a competition between Buddhism and communism. Communism is 100 years old. Only in 2021, Communist Party of China is going to celebrate its 100 year. Buddhism is 2,500 years plus old. And there will be Buddhism for another 2,500 years. As long as there's Buddhism, there will be Tibet, there will be Tibetan people, and Tibetan cause will be born. So in the global context, people are scared. What is this China, the rise in China? We are scared, we are not. But historically, we have invaded them sometimes, they have invaded us sometimes, they have succeeded sometimes, we have succeeded sometimes. So we look Chinese as equals. And Buddhism is the foundation of civilization identity. Hence, you can clearly see, we have a hope to win. So when Martin Luther King said, 
When I turn the mountain top, I will see the equality of white and black Americans. I think if that's all you have to do to succeed, then I said, together is a mountain people. We will climb mountain very easily. You know? So this is the determination of Tibetan people. From 98% and 99% destruction, we have risen. Not risen only in Tibet, but also in China. So hence, Tibetan people, I'm sure when you see people in Guwahati, in Northeast, you see the quiet, silent kind of people, but they're the very determined kind of people. You know one fact? Panda, the animal. We all know, everybody says Chinese animal. No, it's Tibetan bear. 75% of panda comes from Tibetan area. So that's why panda is lovely, cuddly, and friendly. Look at Tibetan bear, you see. <laughs> Not only Tibetans are genetically peaceful, our Tibetan bear panda is also peaceful. China is dragon, it breathes fire. But when the fight comes with the dragon and panda, we know. You saw panda kung fu, right? We win. <laughs> now, why Tibet is relevant? Not just from a cultural civilization point of view, but history, I just told you. For the peace of the world, for peace of Asia, and especially Northeast. Tibet is called the third pole. After Antarctica and Arctic, Tibet has the third highest reserve of ice. The difference is, in fact, Tibet ice or the glaciers are more productive. Because Antarctica and Arctic, when the ice melts, they go to the ocean. When the Tibetan glaciers and snow and ice melt, they form fresh water, streams and rivers. The ten major rivers of Asia flow from Tibet. You all know Brahmaputra is a lifeline of Assam. When I was, when our, my plane was descending yesterday, you know, our flight was descending to uh, Guwahati Airport, I saw a lot of greenery in Assam. And I also saw the Brahmaputra flow. The majestic male Brahmaputra, which cannot be controlled, I was told. Hey, that's the strength of Tibetan water, you know. <laughs> It's flow from Tibet. Indus River. The cradle of Chinese civilization, the term India came from Indus River. It comes from Tibet. Satlaj River, lifeline for Pakistan. And all of Kashmir comes from Tibet. Mekong River, Irrawaddy River, Salvin River, lifeline for whole of ASEAN countries. Vietnam, all these countries, they are Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, they all depend on all these rivers. I'm sorry, all oh, still comes from Tibet. They all come from Tibet. <laughs> Yangtze River of China. We have heard these major dams built on Yangtze River, which is another main river perhaps, which could not be tamed, but they think they have tamed it. Well, it comes from Tibet. So, you can clearly see the Yellow River, cradle of Chinese civilization. I guess it starts from Tibet. So 1.4 billion people in this whole region, South Asia, ASEAN, East Asia, depend on water flowing from Tibet. So if we are not relevant, are we relevant now? Yes. For centuries, we have shared our water with all the neighboring countries. Now, you see bottled water here. You all have to pay, right, nowadays. We have shared free of cost. <laughs> if we have to pay for water, Assam will, Assam will owe us maybe 15% of your GDP. <laughs> had we charged $1 per bottle, I think Tibet would have been the richest country in the world, no? But we are Buddhists. We are panda, <laughs> sharing with everybody. And if you want to have all these rivers flowing to neighboring countries, Tibetan 
should be restored their role as the steward of the Tibetan plateau. Now, you read in the paper yesterday, China wants to divert Brahmaputra River, 1,000 miles tunnel from Tibet to Xinjiang. If that happens, what would Assam do? What would Northeast do? What would Bangladesh do? And the likelihood is high. Because China has 19% of the world population, but only 12% of fresh water. Which means already 400 million Chinese are facing water scarcity. Now if you have a well with water, and your uncle and relatives are all there in one place, and there's a neighbor which you like or don't like, if your well, is, the water is going towards that neighbor, what would you do if uncle and auntie and all your relatives say, we want water, we are dying of thirst? Would you not divert your well towards your relatives, then to your neighbor? So China is facing compulsion. And also, the monsoon of South Asia is determined by the Tibetan plateau. The climate of North South America and North America are determined by the jet stream over Tibet. So the whole, for the whole world, Tibet is the refrigerator. Tibet is the fridge which cools the temperature, which, which maintains and checks the global warming, the climate change. If all these glaciers melt, they are melting very fast on the Tibetan plateau. What will happen to all the neighboring countries? Hence, Tibet is very relevant for peace, for water, for civilization, for the teachings of Buddha, and geopolitically for India and the whole world. So hence, what can India do? China says Tibet is one of their core issues. India should say Tibet is one of India's core issues for the sake of water for the sake of history, for the sake of civilization, and Nalanda tradition. Now, Nalanda universe is destroyed. The Indian government or the Indian administration is taking too long. It's been 10 years the Nalanda universe is not built, not completed, but they're still in makeshift building. But we have preserved the teaching of Buddha. And also, Tibetans have contributed quite a bit for India. You know, I was driving yesterday here in Guwahati, just two days now, yesterday and today. I saw a lot of prayer flags in the cars and bikes of Indian cars, right? For Manipal you see prayer flags. What it does is it brings good luck to people who are hanging it. So, as more and more prayer flags were flying in India, India's economy also grew. India's status as a number one it also is growing. And we have also contributed Momo and Tupa. We all love Momos, right? Well, we brought it from Tibet. Each time you eat Momo, you should remember, oh, thanks to Tibetan people, you know? But if you want to have Amala Momo, authentic tasting Momo, you must go to a Tibetan restaurant. By the way, some people are criticizing uh, for putting Ajinomoto in Momo, right? Momo is Tibetan, Ajinomoto is Chinese. Don't mix the two, you get sick, okay? <laughs> now, other than this you know, small digital -day experience, what's most important is that if you want to have world peace, Ahimsa, is the key. And Tibetans follow Gandhian notion of Ahimsa. We are the sole movement in the whole world nowadays which we follow its Ahimsa and nonviolence. We say nonviolence is the path, nonviolence is the process, and from nonviolence, the result that you get will be also nonviolent and peaceful. Hence, if we succeed, Nonviolence will succeed once again. Ahimsa will succeed once again. 
Gandhi notion of ahimsa will succeed once again. If we succeed, justice and freedom will succeed again. The good guys will win once again. And I am born and brought up in Darjeeling area. And yesterday I met some people from Darjeeling area, but my hometown is between Darjeeling and Kalipong in a small village. My family had just one acre of land. I wanted students to know. And at most there are two or three cows at any given time. Dozen or so chicken. So my winter vacation from school was spent going to forest, cutting trees for home. Sometimes EAB Chaprashi used to catch us here. And cutting grass for our cows, cleaning cow dumps. Help my mother milk cows. Help my parents till one acre of land. That's how I grew up in a humble background. Because I was introduced as someone from Harvard and all the 16 years of Harvard, doctors and Harvard, things like that, right? But my beginning is I studied in refugee school. Tibetan refugee school. So dinner we used to get is only dal and bhat. No aludam, no dalek or sana. Okay. And the lunch we used to get is curry and dumpling. Now when I said curry, you are imagining, oh, Assamese fish curry. No. It was either radish for three months, potato for three months, cabbage for three months. That's the most available, cheapest vegetable in town. And the dumpling. It's not white soft momo that you get in Tibetan restaurant. Okay, it was hard and dark. When you throw it, it bounces higher. <laughs> so we have vice chancellor from science background. The only item that proves Newton's third law wrong. Every action is equal to opposite action. That has more reaction. <laughs> so that's how I grew up. So I didn't have pocket money to go to movies and things like that. Right? But I worked very hard. Very, very hard. So managed to go to Delhi University, Hansraj College and Campus Law Center. Finally, I got Fulbright Scholarship and then managed to go to Harvard to do my master's degree. Then I got a doctorate degree. Then I uh, finished my doctorate in 2004. Then I was employed. I was working at Harvard for seven years. Then election happened. And I was the youngest of the other candidates. All the other five candidates were very veteran. Former Prime Minister, the Speaker, the Deputy Speaker, and most seasoned uh, diplomat, and uh, the you know long-time advisor or secretary to His Holiness Dalai Lama. They all were elder to me, but I won the election again. Now, why I say this is all the students who are here. I'm sure we are of similar background. Yesterday, I met some group from um, Darjeeling. Uh, in the natural economics, uh, the forum that's happening now. And I said, I'm also from Darjeeling. Well, but one was from Vijayanbari and Jorbangla, all that. I said, you all are Bazarwala. You see, you're from town. I'm the Bastiwala. <laughs> so anyone from Basti? Yes, we all are together. We will march to Delhi University in Harvard and come back. Now, that, what I did was, after 16 years in America, I left America, I left my job at Harvard, and I left Starbucks coffee for Assamese chai, and uh, I'm back in Dharamsala. And the salary that I get now, with all respect to professors and vice chancellor, is only 30,000 rupees a month. So I left my job in America to come work for 30,000 rupees a month. Anyone who wants to join me? I'm sure you all are looking for jobs, right? <laughs> but you will get less than 30,000 a month, okay? Because my salary is the highest. <laughs> so I'm sure there was some interest before. Now suddenly 30,000, that sounds like a bit less even for my pocket money, no? And then nowadays, whenever I travel, I travel a lot. After four days, I have to go to Scandinavian countries and in Ottawa, and then come back after one week, I have to go to America, things like that. And I travel by, when I fly, I travel by economy class. I don't fly business class. 
So that way, the Tibetan administration that you see in Dharamsala now is based on values. It's labor of love. You don't work there for salary. You don't work there for perks. You don't work there for bonus. So that is also part of India's contribution. No country has done more than this great country, India, and the people of India. But we have built an administration which is democratic. <coughs> Let me tell you a story. When I ran for election in 2011, the former Prime Minister, we were the final two candidates, right? So we had a debate in Dharamsala. The next day we had a debate in Delhi. So after we debated, when, you, when two candidates debate, it's quite harsh, right? Normally, it's very competitive. So we debated. After that, we had to go to the, Delhi. And so we looked at each other and said, why not we taxi together? So organizers of debate in Delhi were there in that car, and two of the candidates, we drove all the way to Delhi. He was also from San Francisco, I was from Boston. So as we were driving for 10 hours from Dharamsala to Delhi, we found, we, were, we, we, we fell asleep. Then suddenly when I woke up, we found that the taxi driver was following a rule, traffic rule, which is green light, obviously, drive. Yellow light, keep driving. Red light, look, keep driving. <laughs> so we were a bit horrified, you know, we had to stop it. But then we reached Delhi. And the Tibetan organizers also very philosophical, very Buddhist, huh? They had, they, were, they had forgotten the book, hotel room. <laughs> so they look around and finally at 2 a.m. they got two rooms. And one for organizers and one for two candidates. <laughs> now, now the election fever is going on nowadays, right? In India and in Northeast or some places. And our recommendation, this is Tibetan Buddhist democracy, is candidates should share taxi together. Hotel room together, you know, then they will save a lot of money. So this is the Tibetan version, which we learned from India. The original democracy is what we implemented. And the Nalanda tradition is what we have preserved. And we are moving on and fighting the cause. So some might think odds are against you, but we don't think like that. We think odds favor us because we, our foundation of movement is based on 2,500 years of Buddhism, as I said. Communism, some years old, is just a child. <laughs> and finally, when I say this, world peace, I'm pretty sure the world peace will prevail because Tibet is the litmus test for the whole world, for Asia, for India and for China. Because we are the good guys. We follow nonviolence. We follow peaceful way. We follow moderate stand, middle way approach. Right? We follow Ahimsa. Now you see IS and Boko Haram, all this violence that's going on. Which one do you prefer? The Tibetan way, the nonviolent way, the Ahimsa way, the violent way? Nonviolent way? I mean, that's common sense. But if you look around, non-violence do prevail. Soviet Union collapsed, non-violently. Berlin Wall came down, non-violently. When I met the former president of Poland, Leo Wallace, he told me that then Vice Chancellor of West Germany and Foreign Minister of West Germany was visiting him. Then Foreign Minister of West Germany asked him, what do you make of all the students and youth surrounding the Berlin Wall? And he said, the President Leo Wallace said, Berlin Wall is going to come down, be prepared. Then the Foreign Minister of West Germany, what he said, you know, I would like to see that kind of problem, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Two weeks later, Berlin Wall came down. Even the Foreign Minister of West Germany was not prepared for the Berlin Wall to come down. Just a neighboring country, Burma. Five years ago, who would have thought Aung San Suu Kyi would free from a house arrest? Walk the streets of Delhi and go to Oslo and accept a Nobel Peace Prize? Everybody said, oh, she's good, she's principled, but there's no hope. She's walking the streets of Rangoon. Nelson Mandela, he spent 28 years in prison, of which eight years in solitary confinement. People with obituaries about Nelson Mandela saying, oh, forget about restoring democracy in South Africa, he won't free himself. 
Nelson Mandela freed, democracy restored, equality prevailed in South Africa. East Timor, when I met Nobel laureate Ramos Horta, he said he, get lot of he got a lot of invitations from all over the world. One day he got invitation from uh, Midwest of America. He changed three flights to get there. There was one guy who received him at the airport. When he actually went there, there were six guys waiting at the cafeteria and they said, we want to know about East Timor. Only six guys were interested to listen to, listen about East Timor. But comparatively, I can clearly see 1,000 people are interested here in Guwahati University to listen about Tibet. So we are doing pretty, pretty good, actually. <laughs> but my chancellor, she also told me that you all were compelled to come. These classes were shut to make you, so it's mandatory, you know. That also I know. The fact that most of you are staying put, that means you are interested. That means a lot. So, and if you look at all these nonviolent movements which succeeded, collapse of Soviet Union, the Berlin Wall, Aung San Suu Kyi, Nelson Mandela, East Timor, so and so forth, we, the Tibetans, also follow nonviolence. Hence, we do believe our time will come sooner than later. 150 Tibetans have burned themselves, committed self immolation just in the last 78 years. They're saying, we want to see the return of the solemnness to the island of Tibet. We want to see basic freedom of the Tibetan people restored. 150 people to harm oneself, to burn oneself, and cry in pain for basic freedom and return of the solemnness to the It's no small matter. But none of these 150 Tibetans have harmed or hurt single Chinese person or property. <laughs> Tibetan administration, we discourage self immolation but it is happening. That shows how desperate Tibetans are, how painful and sad and tragic Tibet is, but it's said how determined Tibetans are. And I hope that 60 years ago, His Holiness Dalai Lama and my parents came from Assam, Northeast Arunachal Pradesh through Tejpur. We went to Dharamsala. Soon, I hope, the Solonist Dalai Lama and Tibetan people will follow the same path, same track back from Dharamsala to Assam to Arunachal and go back to Tibet. That is the aspiration of Tibetan people. That is the dream of Tibetan people. That is the wish of the elder generation. Hence, we all must work together to make it happen. Why? Because as I said, I and the Tibetan leaders are born and brought up in India. We follow Indian democracy. We follow India's notion of ahimsa. So, nowadays Modi Sarkar talks about make in India to succeed. If make in India is to succeed, the original made in India, the Tibetan movement has to succeed first. We are the original community. So I hope and pray with your support and help, we will succeed. And we will come through Assam and go to Tibet. Thank you very much.